Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Elite with Giants TV here. This is Tal hosting our guest this evening is Bob Berg. We'll do a little bit of introduction to our panel, but welcome back. This is part two of our interview this evening. We'll start with Bob. Do a little bit of quick introduction of yourself and where are you hanging out from today? I am hanging out from my home in Jupiter, Florida, and uh, having a great time. Just got back from, a, from an event in Kansas City with just a terrific, terrific group of people and company, but boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing like being home. Yeah, well, you've got a neighbor there in Florida, so which uh, Dan Forbes is next. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, Dan Forbes, uh, founder of the Lead with Giants uh, community. You can find out more about our community at leadwithgiants.com. We are on Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and any other social media platform that comes out. And I'm hanging from Sarasota, Florida, right across the state from Jupiter. It's good to see you, Bob, Tal. Good to see you. Liz, Steve. Great. How far is Jupiter from, from Sarasota? Uh, well, the planet I or the <laughs> it depends if you're talking about the planet or the, or the city. Probably no, about three, come about, on now. <laughs> about three hours, three and a half hours. Okay, from here to Austin. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Let's go right ahead. Hi, I'm Liz Stinselli with Stinselli Advisors coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah today. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. And Steve. Hello, I'm Steve Bro from Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm an executive coach and author. Great, glad to have you here. Uh, and you're on the West Coast, uh, West Coast time, right? I'm on Mountain Standard time, but we don't do daylight savings time. Oh goodness! Mm -hmm. Oh, good All for right. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had a great discussion on on segment one, and I want to, you know, transition us to the the uh, the book adversaries into allies and I have to say at first I was thinking it was another political book out there but it, it's not uh, but w without getting into the political scene here uh, tell us how much can we learn I know there's great chapters about relationships and really having a positive influence on the people that we are interacting with on a daily basis but how much can we learn or the leaders of our country can learn from your book, I know it's not a political book, but it is about relationships and positive influence. What what do we need to learn, or what can we learn from that? Well, on a very very basic level, the book itself is about mastering people skills. And certainly, if we uh, you look at our politicians at this point, if we're going to take it political, many of them are are so involved in vitriol and insulting the other side that. Uh, it really doesn't make for a for a a good relationship or a healthy relationship. It's very adversarial in nature, and you know that doesn't mean that people have to compromise on their values. Tact and kindness and respect should not be confused with compromise. There's a time and place for compromise, certainly, mm -hmm. but that the, the two are not necessarily the same. But you can have your point of view and you can stand very strong on principle and at the same time you can uh, you can still respect the other person and you can speak to that other person with respect. And, and I, I think too often that's not what's happening. And not only do we see this on the major political scene with the politicians themselves, we see this certainly on the pundits, with the pundits on TV, because their ratings are not made by being agreeable and, and being kind. It's by really focusing on what they disagree with and attacking the other person. And then it trickles down to... Facebook conversations and Twitter and, and personal conversations where people uh, insult the motives of the other person rather than looking at that person as a human being with good intentions, even if their way of going about something might differ. So, you know, I think we can make a, a political case that we could utilize this in politics, mm -hmm. but really what it is and what the book's about is being able to bring out the best in other people, attain personal satisfaction uh, while making that other person feel very comfortable and feel very good about themselves. Bob, this is Steve. There's a line from The Godfather that says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Now, I, I understand that's probably attributed to the Chinese author Sun Tzu. Would you comment on this philosophy of keep your enemies close? and how that might tie in with the uh, idea of changing adversaries into allies? 
Well, Steve, I'm, I'm not sure if it directly relates to it, but I think there's certainly something to be said about knowing what someone's up to that isn't your adversary, that, that isn't your ally right now, because right. not everybody is, and not everybody is going to be. So I think that's a very, and you know, what's interesting about Sun Tzu's book, because peop, a lot of people have read the title and think it's about, you know, a, a violent kind of, uh, you know, overcoming and conquering and so forth like that. But it really wasn't so much about that. In Thomas Clary's translation in the introduction, he talked about, in summing up a story, and I won't take the time to sum up the story, but it was basically to win without fighting uh, is the greatest victory. And when we can frame a situation in such a way that we never have to have that person as an adversary in the first place, yes. that's always the best way to do it. Of course, we also have to be able to turn that potential. Every, you know, the the uh, sa the uh, sages asked, and I, I led the book with this quote: "Who is a mighty person?" And answered, "That person who can control their own emotions and make of an enemy or of a potential enemy a friend." So we also need to know how to do that. Take that person who may be uh, coming into the situation in a way that's not productive, and through controlling our own emotions and utilizing the other principles of ultimate influence, be able to now have and have a, a relationship uh, based on uh, being allies and not adversaries. You it's know, Bob, I, I think about um, Abraham Lincoln, right? Who after after the war appointed many of his adversaries to his cabinet and in key positions and turn them into into allies. Do you see him as sort of a model of this? Um, I actually quote Abraham Lincoln several times in this book as well as Benjamin Franklin. Uh, the two of those the two of those people had magnificent ways of being able to uh, to turn adversaries into allies and of course Lincoln when he picked his cabinet these were the very same people who said he was not qualified to be president. These were the same people who just had a real dislike for him. But because he knew they were the best people for the job and for the positions, he sought them out and he asked them. And, uh, you know, that's a leader. That's a person who says, you know, that's that level five leader that, that you know, Collins talked about. Uh, that, that, wow, you know, they're putting the team in front of themselves. They're putting the, the country, in, you know, they're putting the, uh, the situation, uh, the company in, uh, ahead of themselves. And so I, I have so much admiration. Of course, some of his, the things he would say, I, he was once approached by a newspaper man uh, uh, telling him that uh, a, a, another government official, as often happens, said something negative about him. And he was, of course, trying to to um, bring Lincoln into a public debate he could report uh, on. And instead, Lincoln said, well, I have a great deal of respect for that man, and if he feels that way, there must be some merit to it. And what that did is it totally just deflected the blow. You know what I'm saying? In boxing, that would be a parry. You know, the, the, the jab comes in. You don't try to push it away. You just kind of flick it away, parry it away, and it takes all the power out, takes all the, the strength out. And it was those sort of things that he did that won people over to his side and turned them into very, very loyal friends because, as you know, that cabinet who so disliked him, they loved him at the end. And Ben Franklin, of course, just had, a, and he was a guy who at first was not very tactful and was not really great when it came to people's skills, but he invented his own course uh, in which he could take some of his less positive characteristics and turn them into positive characteristics and he had some great teaching. His book Benjamin Franklin the Autobiography is a book that I just suggest everybody get. What wisdom, what wonderful, wonderful lessons. Hey, maybe we can get him on um, League with Giants TV, Tal. <laughs> we'll certainly try. You know, I, I just as I'm hearing you guys talk about that is the first thing that comes to mind too and in in that was known to be disarming was Ronald Reagan. At the end of the day, you know, politics were politics, but the relationships that he built with his adversaries, uh, and to me, adversary sounds a little harsh. It's almost like an enemy, if you will, but he knew where to draw the line and play the game to where his politics were still his politics, but at the end of the day, he was disarming, had a great sense of way to relate to people rather than 
uh, you know, come across as, as an adversary to in many of his relationship. What do you think about that, Bob? It, well, can I pick up on something that you said uh, sure. that was very insightful about the word adversary? Because we're, you know, I'm often asked, well, so is everybody who disagrees with you uh, an enemy? You know, no, not at all. It could be situational. It could be the customer service representative who's a, a nice person, mm -hmm. but you need to bring something back. And if you're like me, you lost your uh, receipt and they have a policy of no returns without receipts, and this person isn't equipped. They're not trained to be able to deal with someone and make them happy, so you need to be able to work with them tactfully and be able to, uh, and that's fine. But, you know, there was a, um, uh, and you'd have to be, I guess, a real baseball fan to, to know this name, but, but there was a, a gentleman by the name of Sadaharu O. Oh. He was a, a prolific home run hitter in Japanese professional baseball. And he had a, a wonderful quote. He said, I never saw the opposing pitcher as my adversary, but rather as my partner in hitting home runs. Hmm. And I always thought that that was wonderful. Now, it's not that the, the pitcher saw it that way. <laughs> they certainly didn't see themselves as, as his partner in hitting home runs, but that's okay. He saw it that way. And, it's, and so when we talk about adversaries in the terms of the book, Adversaries into Allies, we're really simply talking about our partners in attaining personal satisfaction while we help them do the same. Right. Uh, that's it's a wonderful insight because you know we, when it's you're right people think about an adversary as as not someone who is necessarily positive but you're looking at it from a you know how can we bring the best in this relationship sure. okay so that's great Bob can you j just briefly discuss a little bit about egos and some of the issues that arise sure. when two well, egos so come together. <laughs> Well, that, you know, that's so important, Liz, because when you think of it, what is the ego? The ego literally is the I. It's that sense of ourself that understands, that knows that we're a unique individual, separate from everyone else, which sometimes is a little politically incorrect to say uh, in, a, in a world that's becoming more and more collectivist in a sense. But, uh, you know, and, and hey, we learn from, from books like Think and Grow Rich. There's the you know, universal consciousness, the mastermind, the quantum physics tells us the, uh, the, the uh, you know, atoms vibrate at a speed that connects with others. And, and you know, I agree, there's, it's, we're all probably part of one whole, you know, and all that's great. I believe it. But that doesn't conflict with the fact that as human beings in our earthly existence, we also operate as individuals. We exist as individuals. And our egos, which can be a real driving force, when it's harnessed, it's wonderful. We can accomplish great things, both for ourselves and for society as a whole. When the ego is in control of us, that's when it's not healthy. And we need to acknowledge that in ourselves, certainly. But when I say acknowledge the other person's ego, and I certainly don't mean verbally acknowledge it, like, hey, pal, you know, your ego, it, you know, that will have the opposite effect. But what I do mean is to acknowledge that if that person is speaking or acting in a way that is rude or defensive or counterproductive in any way, there's a good chance that he's operating not out of a logic base, but that he or she is operating out of an ego base. And that ego uh, will trigger the emotion, and that's how their decisions are going to be made. So we need to keep that in mind and respect the fact that their ego probably will come into play. I truly believe that about 90% of being able to move another person gently to your point of view is how you make them feel about themselves and about you at the time. And that's why it's so important to respect the fact that the other person's ego will probably come into play. Wow, these are these are great great topics. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a great oh, discussion, uh, very engaging. So uh, I thank you for your time. Hopefully, we'll do this sometime in the future. I loved your. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the book or read the book, this is the the latest one that uh, Bob has. Um, and let me conclude with two things. Bob, tell us where people can find you, and then we'll conclude with Dan Forbes giving us a little bit more about our community before we close. So, Bob, tell us where people can find you. 
Uh, sure, they can visit me right at www.burg.com, and while they're there, they can uh, uh, check out the different books and download Chapter 1, subscribe to my Influence and Success Insights if they'd like, check out the blog, connect on social media, uh, so come to Berg.com and, and hang out if you'd like. And I just want to thank you all for having me. I love what you all are doing. Uh, I think it's just such a tremendous service to humanity, and, and thank you for having me on the show. Great, great. Go ahead, Dan. Yes, yeah, so uh, leadwithgiants.com is a place where people can go to learn how to connect uh, with our community across uh, Google+, Plus, of course, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Our vision is to raise up 10,000 uplifting leaders, and you'll find out what we mean about that at the website. And our mission is simple, helping leaders become better leaders. One way we're doing that is with Lead With Giants TV. Taos now is our TV producer. Back to you, Tao. All right, great. Texas size host here. Uh, Liz and, and Steve, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's good to be here. Great, great. Glad you can join us this evening. So we'll go ahead and close this episode number two. Thanks, everybody, and our audience, I know, will, will benefit greatly.